what inspires healthy behavior, <laughs> those kinds of things. So I am only very nicely manipulating people <laughs> using that information. <laughs> You know, and one of the other um, Venn diagrams in Yaz's and my backgrounds is that um, many of you who, you know, we've worked together for a long, long time know that I used to do quality of life um, analysis of communities. And we had these seven indexes and we would measure a community's quality of life based on these seven indexes. And uh, one of them was about, you know, arts and creativity and how that related to quality of life. And Yaz's master's degree from the University of Chicago was about the impact that artists make on economic and community development inside their communities and neighborhoods. So, so um, we, we, have, we have a lot in common, but we're different in a lot of ways too. So um, Yaz, one of the things that um, I wanna do with all of our Futures Friday webinars moving forward is I yes. wanna continue to sharpen everybody's mm -hmm. signal pickup right? Mm -hmm. sense making. We've talked about this before, how important signals are, being able to pick up on signals. In fact, some of you were with us for a sense making panel that featured one of our participants here today, Steve Craig, along with Ann Gergen, Charlie Grantham, Mayor Mark Funkhauser, and myself. And we demonstrated in front of a live audience how we do our twice week weekly signals panel. And of course, mm -hmm. yes, you and I, with all of our clients, we teach this as a as a fundamental skill that we repeat every time we meet with folks. So mm -hmm. let's you and I do a very tiny round of sense making, signal, okay. signal grabbing. What is one signal that you're picking up on right now? Uh, and what are you thinking about it? Okay. Uh, well, I have two, so, but I'm gonna bring up the one that's funnier, I think, <laughs> between the two of them. Uh, which is, I saw an article, some of you may have seen this or heard this before. I saw an article that talks about how thousands of people are purchasing airline food as, as something to snack at home on. Um, and that's their means of trying to uh, think back or relive, you know, those days when you used to be able to get on an airplane and travel somewhere. Um, so that's my, that's my like, what, what's happening? <laughs> kind of, are people crazy moment with that one? Um, but it made me think about what are all those nostalgic new experiences that become now a thing to sell, to commercialize? Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there with that. So, so you're that? saying, so you're saying that the nostalgia is for stale peanuts, basically, in that, that there seems to be an overwhelming desire for stale peanuts. It's not the stale peanuts. It's <laughs> where would you eat stale peanuts? Oh, in the air. Probably up in the air. <laughs> so it's our memories, it's our, our experiences associated with these with food, with products. Interesting. Right? We no longer experience in our current circumstances. At least most people can. Um, yeah. So I think, I think um, it looks weird, but you know, before the pandemic, we already had a wave of nostalgia, like remakes of old movies, or there was like other things, bringing them up to date to, the, to today. Uh, and I think uh, we're, we're just gonna see more of that, but now it's pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, with it's a nostalgic retroactive look that gets commercialized. I think that's kind of fun and interesting. Um, and yeah, it just was weird <laughs> when I saw that article. Yeah, and a business opportunity. Steve Craig posted in the chat that um, their local ballpark, although there are no games, you can get the ballpark food to go. There's something about the crack on a good hot dog, um, <laughs> says the vegan. I, I, I have nostalgia too. Um, okay, so let me share uh, a signal that I am picking up, Yaz, and I've been um, talking about this with my sense-making panel for a while, but mm. it's relatively new. So three, three mornings a week, I go for a run in my neighborhood, and um, something that I started to notice several weeks ago were these um, very new and somewhat matching tents in our central park. And outside of three of the five tents that I saw mm. that first morning, were matching brown envelopes of, of, or brown bags of food. It looked mm -hmm. like someone had either delivered something the night before or delivered something that morning. And um, when I brought this to the signals panel, um, one of our other signal makers, signal gatherers, said that um, in her community, the local um, 
the local government had decided that it was much safer for homeless people to shelter in tents mm -hmm. out in the open air than to shelter all together. Mm -hmm. And so in order to flatten the curve and um, bring the incidence of COVID down, um, that was something that many cities were doing. I do not know if um, it was it is the city of Madison or Dane County that is um, doing this, but I will tell you the number of tents has proliferated. Uh, the, these tents, I didn't count them the last time I went through, but there are many, 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 many more tents. So I don't know if they are, um, alternative shelters for homeless people. I don't know if more people are being evicted in Madison. It's hard to tell right now because there's so much turnover because of the student population. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the things that I am noticing in my community. And I am nervous about cold weather coming uh, and what's gonna happen with folks who don't have uh, a place to go this winter. So um, mm -hmm. with that, let's jump in to the main event today. So one of the things that um, Yaz and I have been talking about, and, and we often talk with clients about this, because a client will come to us and say, we already have a strategic plan. Mm -hmm. What does foresight have to offer? Like, I don't get it. What is the difference between strategic foresight and strategic planning? And Yaz, I wonder how you approach that very honest question on the parts of people who are like, what the hell is foresight? Strategic foresight, strategic planning, both have strategic in the name. How do you mm -hmm. respond? How do you respond? I have two kinds of responses to that. Uh, one is to ask them um, what assumptions did they use to create their current strategic plan? Is what, where, where did those assumptions come from? Um, we say typically or very often these assumptions are based on the past, the previous plan, the history, the present. Um, if they come back and say, oh no, it's based on the future, well then, ooh, <laughs> that's a whole different story. That's the, what we argue, that is what strategic foresight is supposed to be. You're supposed to plan for the future based on the future uh, without ignoring your, your past as well. But so one question is, right, what assumptions are underlying your current plan? The other uh, point I would raise with them is, would you like to stress test your plan in alternative futures? Because even professional futurists don't know what the future will be. Um, and so, you know, the, the idea of war gaming is very uh, well known in the military community. And I just read a 1980s report on war gaming. That was very cool. Um, but these are different scenarios and you can test your strategies in different environments. And maybe that can help you think about unintended consequences and potential unexpected or expectable partnerships, things like that. So, so my response would be in, in both two directions. Where do you come from with this plan? And where would you, would you like to make sure it helps you uh, keep things pointed the, the way you want to go, yeah. um, depending in, on how the future will actually unfold? I have a feeling that that second point that you're making about stress testing your plan against the future, I think that's going to be very, very potent for people in this next near term. Um, I'm thinking even about some of our clients, you know, we've done 2040 plans for clients and now they're mm -hmm. like, uh, like <laughs> how much of this still holds up, you know, like, uh, yeah. because it's, an, and, and it's so easy to come at that with either or thinking to say, oh, rip, rip. Now we have to tear the whole thing up and start mm -hmm. over because obviously we're in a different world. I actually don't think that that's true. I think you should find, like, go through whatever your plan was in a very um, discerning way and say, where have we actually leapt forward five or six years? What is possible yeah. now in this plan that wasn't possible before? Because many of your organizations are probably already in 2025 in some places. And the mm -hmm. standard one that everybody talks about is virtual work. Yes, one of the things you said mm -hmm. when you talked about, um, you know, talking to people like, is your current strategy based on the past? Mm -hmm. Or is it based on what's coming? Um, I find that extremely useful as well. And I wonder, um, I'm sorry, I'm going off script a little bit, but Go you're on. smarter than me. <laughs> it's by, Friday, you can do it. <laughs> um, yeah, but what I, what I wonder is, I, I mean, I don't throw the past out, you know, wholesale. Like right. th there is a place for history as mm -hmm. we work the future. 
-hmm. And I wonder, like, what, what do clients ask about their history? How do you think about using history as you're planning for the future? Mm -hmm. So far, I have had, when, when it comes to history, the most recent thing I heard is start from a blank, blank slate for this project. So in fact, an explicit ask to ignore, uh, not devalue, but to ignore history assumptions to start from scratch. So that was one response I've gotten from a, from a client so far about you know, the role of history in the project. Um, another thing I saw, there's a, um, there's a neat little book by Richard Lum. It's called Four Steps to the Future. And um, it's right here, okay. Um, and actually what I saw, what he does is when, you, when, when he develops a futures project with a client, he starts with the history analysis. He works with the client to say, all right, how have things changed over the last decade or two in your field, in your industry? Articulate those forces of change. And then the next step comes, okay, which of these forces do you think will uh, continue going forward? Which new ones will come? So you could actually, when you're developing scenarios, you could start with the past, analyzing that, coming up with what exactly, how have changes been driven in your field in the past, and then have develop an explicit understanding of how that may or may not be the same going forward. Um, but we, I, I personally, I've done that a little bit when I, um, in my work with the Institute for Alternative Futures, for example, we developed um, alternative scenarios of public health, uh, primary care, uh, gosh, what else did we do? Vulnerable populations for one of the major foundations in this country. And it always starts with the background section. Like, what is this topic we're trying to tackle? What do we know as of today, what, how we got here? And then now let's think about the future, what trends and forces might do and interact with and how, how, what might be the implications from there. Um, so I guess a foresight project can be anywhere from ignore the history, start with a blank page, start with today, to give a little background of how we got here in the first place, to let's do a serious analysis of the history of our field. Um, you can pick and choose any of these, and perhaps it depends on depends on you, the goals of your project. What are you trying to do? Is it important to you to acknowledge and understand the past before you can turn forward, or is that something everyone already knows about, or something that that's a design it how you want it kind of uh, face? That's my yeah. understanding of that. Yeah. What would you say to that, Rebecca? Well. <laughs> Um, How did you respond? Yeah. So <laughs> I'm going to be so honest with you. Um, okay. <laughs> so even if a client says, just throw out the history of what we've done, we just want to move forward in thinking about the future, I would mm. acknowledge that wish. And then I may privately do my own x ray of their system. Because mm. one of my key insights over the last five or six years is that. If we don't, I, I refer to it as DNA, but you make of it what you will. But I think every system, whether it's a company or a community or a state, there's there's like a there's almost like a genetic disposition that gets established, and this is a tr especially true in in strong cultures or mm -hmm. places that really have a sense of identity. If we're thinking on the city side. Mm -hmm. And so my evolution on this has really changed because I used to be really, really biased about let's just talk about the future, forget the past. And while that may still be the emphasis in the work that we do with clients, you know, that we do trends analysis and we have them discuss and debate what they think the most important things are going to be that will affect their future. Mm -hmm. um, I always try to do at least some kind of a briefing on the DNA of this client. Um, and, and now, so, so I'll give you an example. Um, there's a client we're working with right now, and I'm thinking a lot about the culture of this client because, um, it seems clear to me from the trend work and the way that this, 
future is unfolding is mm -hmm. that there's going to have to be a very collaborative dance with the future and a dance with their key stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And it seems like this client has a, a bit of a more paternalistic feeling towards their um, key stakeholders. And mm -hmm. if, if that's the case, there's going to be some grinding that happens mm -hmm. because if I'm feeling paternalistic towards you and so maybe like, I feel like I have to take care of you and you don't want to be taken care of, you want to be co-equal. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to have a hard time making a future together. Uh, you know, so <laughs> it's not here. I feel like you and I just got married just ever so briefly right there. Um, but <laughs> but you, you, you get, you get what I'm saying, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, it's yes. So I can tell that that triggers something for you. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Um, okay. So what it triggers for me is um, I don't want to jump ahead, but um, our, our new foresight process, step number one is sensing. And I know we'll get into that, but not just sensing what's going on around you, but also some, but sensing what's going on on the inside. And so um, what you just brought up is, that history of dynamics, of interactions, or, I mean, interpersonal, intergroup, but also of the place, right, um, context. These things knowingly or unknowingly shape how we interpret, how we see, how we respond to each other. And so I think that makes sense that you, you can't, you, you technically should not ignore your history at all. Um, you got to be mindful of how has your relationship with yourself, with the other parties, with your environment, how, what is that relationship? And so then if you want to create a new future or a better future, um, can you leverage or do you have to circumnavigate and change some of those dynamics? That, that historical understanding, I think, is part of the sensing step. Um, it, it, that's sort of the connection I'm drawing yeah. as I, as and I, to you. Yeah, I couldn't yeah. have said it better myself because it's one, it's one of the reasons I redid the foresight process this year because we were not doing that step. And mm. it's not just like, how is your DNA wired? But, you know, I often ask people, what is the story that your organization tells itself about itself? Mm hmm and what is the story that others tell about your organization? And you know, we did this in camp where we looked through four different windows into mm -hmm. the domain and all mm -hmm. of them were intended to sense. Mm -hmm. um, let's leave it there for now. I did, you, you pointed to it, we're gonna talk about it. I just added a JPEG of the foresight process. This is our new foresight process. Um, this is what we're teaching in camp now. This is what, um, uh, you know, we're, we're using to shape all of our client projects moving forward. I feel, I feel, I felt like timidly proud about it uh, until camp when Cindy Richmond, um, who works in economic development in Virginia, said, this is the best thing you've ever done. And then she's been at, to camp two years, two different years. And she said, this is the best thing you've ever done. And that kind of emboldened me like, all right, welcome to the gun show. Like, best thing I've ever done. So, um, oh. So let's talk a little bit about this four phase process. Yes. And I think um, for each of us, I don't know that this is true. I mean, we didn't rehearse this, you guys at all. We didn't rehearse this. No. But yes, when you look at the foresight process, what are the parts of this that you feel very attracted to? And what mm -hmm. are the parts of it that you're like, kind of out of my depth here, not my favorite part? Because not all futurists can do all these, all these bits well. Maybe some yeah. can. Uh, this is hard. Oh, I think every step can potentially get derailed and that and uh, and the derailing part is not my favorite part at all <laughs> that's kind of a crappy answer to your question um i find perhaps um ah wait so so the question is which parts which what do i most enjoy about this process perhaps the which parts do i like the most or which parts are are sort of yeah for me it's like um, that, right that zing of energy right where you're like ding like i love that you know oh this is my favorite versus the parts that just kind of like make you shrivel up inside and want to call in sick to work <laughs> oh boy um i think the parts that really um that I, I really get joy out of is actually the workshop phase when people sort of have this aha moment of using the scenarios. Um, so 
It's, it's, oh, okay, these are not just stories, but, oh, look at these ideas that we may or may not have thought about. Maybe it confirms something, maybe it clarifies something, but it's the aha of using the scenarios to think about strategies that make sense in multiple futures. Um, I, I just remember like when we, when we did in-person workshops too, it's people come up to you afterwards and they're like, this is amazing. Like, I love thinking this way. And maybe, maybe that's sort of, that's maybe my, my most satisfied feeling moment, which is I don't, I'm not here to really change anyone's mind, but to bring perspective. Mm. And they use this opportunity to identify, to discover something new they didn't think about before, or they, they didn't know they were thinking until they, they've gone through this process. So to see that in people go through it, come to those conclusions, I think that that's my favorite. That's, that makes everything worth it. Because let me tell you, hunting down trends, <laughs> writing scenarios. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, it's my job, but that is very labor intensive. It is labor intensive. No joke. <laughs> Yeah, so what Yaz is talking about is if you open the JPEG that we threw in the chat, and I'm going to, um, we had a couple people who just showed up, so I'm going to put it in the chat again for those of you who um, just, just got here. Um, but Yaz was talking about the second phase in purple there, the imagining phase. Scenarios is one of the tools we use to help people imagine um, and seeing the lights come on. Um, I have to say, um, I think one of my favorite parts in a client process um, mm -hmm. is there's this moment when the handoff happens and I have mm -hmm. only rarely had to make that explicit. But what happens is, um, you know, we as the consultants do a lot of the lifting and the training in the early days. Right. And then there's this point at which it's like, it's like we, we round, we're rounding the big corner and all of a sudden you can clearly see the client put their hand back and they take that torch. And now it's their language and it's their plan and it's their, um, they own it now. You know, they start putting it in their PowerPoint decks and in their Excel frameworks. And um, that to me feels like, Ugh, it just brings tears to my eyes thinking about it because, you know, one of my missions in life is to train as many people how to do this as possible. Let a thousand flowers bloom. And when that handoff happens, it very much feels like, you know, we got another start in the ground. We got someone else who really gets this and is now going to, going to make it, make it their own. Um, so that to me is like the, the part of the process that gives me the most zing, but I, I never know when it's going to happen. Um, yeah. But if it does happen, I think the plan has way more chance of success. I mean, just intuitively, that makes sense for us. Um, but I think, you know, as consultants, to know that that's what we're going for. It's like as a parent, you're, you're, you're not trying to raise great kids. You're trying to raise great adults. You're trying to raise effective human beings in the world, right? And that's kind of how I feel about this process with our, with our clients is we want to arm them so that when they say, I did this futuring project, you're like, yeah, they did it the right way. They get it. They know it. It's in them. One other thing I did want to add about the, um, the history part of this, I, I can't not mention this. So I'm going to go back in time just a little bit. So Yaz and I were discussing um, how history plays into the work that we do. And some of the people I admire the most. So Rowena Morrow was one of the guests on our program. She talked about hope as a strategy a few Fridays mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if she, I cannot remember if she did it during our Futures Friday, but she definitely did it during our prep uh, call. Mm -hmm. And she started by acknowledging that she herself was placed in land that was original, originally part of an Aboriginal First Nation. I don't know the name of the one that she, she was, uh, which First Nation it was, I can't remember, but she said it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did some work here in Wisconsin where Sauk County and the Ho-Chunk Nation, Nation of the Big People, did mm -hmm. work together. And one of the things we did at the start of every one of those meetings is we would have somebody from the county and somebody from the Ho-Chunk open every meeting. And the Ho-Chunk 
always started by thanking their ancestors. And the very last workshop, we had a, we had a fire and a, a smoke ceremony. And there's a depth, a depth to noting that history. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I too, right now I am on earth. I am on land in Madison, Wisconsin. That is originally the land of the Ho-Chunk, the, the people of the big voice. And, um, they have a, com the, the Ho-Chunk nation has a completely different way of thinking about intergenerational work. They have a, they work on 50 year futures, not 20 year futures. I learned more from my work with the Ho-Chunk Nation than I, I think I learned at the University of Houston, truly, because of how in, in this is so in them as a yeah. people. It's how they think. So in any event, um, yeah, it was, it was a really, really, really cool experience. So um, let, me, let me talk about your least favorite part of this foresight <laughs> process, this new foresight process. Are there any parts of it? You alluded to how much work it is to do trends analysis. You yeah. do it very well. Oh, thank um, you. You're welcome. <laughs> so which, which phase and which part? Which phase? You know, okay, here's the part. The phase is, again, imagining for me. And this was, I think it was worse at the beginning, back when I started out in futures, uh, which is you've done all your research on different forecasts of what the futures might be and different, you have those huge body of possibilities and then someone comes up to you and says all right make up a story <laughs> now i have no creative writing background the last time i wrote a story that was worth reading out loud to other people that was completely made up that was in middle school uh for i think it was a grammar test in german or something like that and instead of doing boring grammar exercises we were told write a story and I still have that story, by the way. I was, I used to be very funny. Um, and it was like complex. I was writing about like how love and hate are actually part of the same character. And there was somehow, I don't know. There, there, how old were you, you little stuff. Zen master? <laughs> this was, um, hold on, middle, middle school. I was probably 13, 14 um, when I wrote this story. So that was the last time I, I wrote a, like out of thin air, I drew a creative story that was like cool to share <laughs> and then it's been going downhill since like it's always you've had a 20 year days. dry spell <laughs> <laughs> it is I, it can be hard um uh, and so you know and i my like i, I mentioned earlier my background uh, when i started out in futures my background was psychology it was study it was like the individual not societal forces and so but our projects was the future of social economic vulnerability of populations or the future of primary care and so when you don't come with the right subject matter background and then you are told to co-author stories about the future one of the hardest yes hardest things to do um but now that i've been doing it for at least 10 years i mean yes you develop the subject matter understanding but actually it's it's taken me a while but but the, the truth is, I think writing stories, it needs to be simplified. Um, it, it seemed like this magical thing, like we, some of my colleagues were really creative writers and they came up with these amazing storylines. And I was sort of just, I was better at editing than coming up with a storyline in the first place. And that's okay. I mean, you've got to start from somewhere. Um, but now when I think about, so that was my least favorite part, mostly because I didn't know how to do it well. I think that's what I was uh, struggling with. But now when I think about writing scenarios, I think if we break down the process, create your building blocks, see how you can connect the dots to come up with a storyline um, and sort of work from that, try to flesh it out from that. When you, when you break down the process, um, I think it becomes a lot more doable, less horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> for me. <laughs> so I'm getting you know, better. <laughs> absolutely. And you know, our, our clients are benefiting from, from your difficulty because this is the part of the process that I also have always found challenging. And you know, we went through about a year last year 
where um, I was just hitting our team like this is not working. The process we are using for this is not working. This must be improved. And yes, I mean, just last week I went through a process uh, as your wingman on a project and I was blown away by how good the stories were after just an hour. But the truth is it was an hour of together time, but it was dozens of hours of prep time to get all those prompts together for those folks. So, um, I mean, this is what I mean about like your strengths of being highly organized. And sometimes I feel like, frankly, I mean, we've talked about this. Sometimes I think you overthink it a little bit and like you over prepare yeah. just a little bit um, because too much, too many prompts can be disorienting for folks too. But between my lack of structure and your um, just innate sense of needing structure, and we both know what the end product should look like, you've mm -hmm. done just a brilliant job and our clients are benefiting uh, from this. Thank you. I gotta say 50% of that successful outcome was because our client <laughs> worked with his staff to, to develop those building blocks. So I, I can't succeed if my counterpart doesn't do his part. And, and in that case, he, he more than exceeded. I, I, was, I was very happy. <laughs> yeah. I'm used to projects where the futurists have to do everything. We go and interview the client and his staff, and then we go back home and we develop everything. Yes, yes, yes. So that's well, where I come from as a process. Yeah. yeah, I mean, what you're saying, remember when I talked about the handoff of the baton, I think what you're mm. saying with this particular client, you guys are on a tandem bicycle together. <laughs> and that really, I mean, it's a, it's a totally different um, dynamic when you have somebody pedaling as hard as you are um, on the client side, but that's not the norm. You know, the norm is that we do more of the lifting for the client until such point as it gets closer to implementation. And I've got to say, um, you know, my least favorite part of the process is the doing part. Um, my give, you know, left to my own devices, I stay at the 30 or 60,000 foot view and I think about the connections and I feel like I'm always kind of like, um, way above looking down and sensing the patterns. And then people are like, how are we going to start? And I am literally like, like, I don't know how we're going to start. But I like that part too. <laughs> it's the so what. So what you came up with to, with these grand conclusions, like, how are you going to go <laughs> get it started? What are you going to do now? <laughs> yep. Yep. It's sort of a, like, a, like a, you read a great book and then it, the story ends and you have sort of a hangover from the story. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't want to hang over from a foresight project. Like <laughs> they gotta, they gotta make that transition. So that's why I, I that's why I appreciate um, strategic doing, which thankfully you, uh, pointed out to me it exists at all in the first place that's right so in that doing phase which is the fourth phase in our new model um, implementation has always been a part of what we do but prior to learning strategic doing learning 4dx the four disciplines of ex execution we didn't have frameworks to help people take action to help clients take action and these are two of some of the most dynamic uh, frameworks that we have. Um, we've used the four disciplines of execution in Asheville and in Buncombe County. Um, strategic doing is now part of every offering um, that we that we have. So, um, all right, yes, we've got, um, we have a, a couple more questions, but we have great questions from our audience. In the chat, yes. We do, we do. Um, why don't we each pick out a question that we would like the other person to answer? So, okay. <laughs> Oh man, they're all good. Okay. All right, I've got mine. You can go first though. Okay, just a moment. Sorry, I'm still picking. Uh... See what I mean? How thorough she is, you guys? <laughs> Sorry, I'm reading everyone's. <laughs> Okay, okay, blah, 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 blah. Okay, I think I picked mine too. Well, you go, you, you ask first and then- No, I'll no, ask. you ask first. Oh, oh you no. Have dibs. You have dibs. Okay, I have dibs, thank you. Um, this is a good one. I think it's, um, 
since we're trying to teach more people to think this way, but uh, Katie is asking what is and is not a signal. And she says a signal to grab. Um, As opposed to... Like to oh, a I mean, if we just were picking up all signals at all times, we would be overwhelmed. Um, mm -hmm. Well, me if we would be overwhelmed. Um, how do I decide a signal to grab? So I, I always start with the domain. Like, what is the domain I'm working on? And like, Katie is a member of a school board, but she's a former county um, executive. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess I would think about like, what domain am I thinking about? And then I would try to think hard about that for a while. Um, you know, like just doing signals work one day a month um, probably isn't sufficient if you're really trying to develop a picture of what's happening. And the other thing I would say is just doing signal work by yourself is not recommended. And it's not just because I'm a good time gal who loves to collaborate with others. Um, I've done signaling, signal and sense making on my own yeah. and I've done it with others. And the results are always so much better with others because you're all picking up different signals from different domains. And, you know, like Steve's on our call today, I, I assume he would agree with that. I mean, if Steve was just doing signal, signal sensing on his own, it would be a very different thing than doing it with our, with our signals and SME group uh, twice a week. So I would start with the domain. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't do a one-off. I wouldn't just say, okay, I'm going to scan these 1,100 sources for the next two days and we'll see what happens from there. Uh, so I would make a prolonged effort to pick up signals and I would do it with others. And I think you, then you start to sort of develop your sensitivity around it. And um, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll end there. What do you think? I would like to add to this. Yes, yes. and... Um... If you want to make sure you're not picking up only technology signals or only, I don't know, economic signals, um, that you should also, you know, what other signals to grab? Well, signals that meet these other categories or topics you want to think about. So the standard one we always talk about is steep, right? Society, technology, economics, environment, and politics as, as buckets. Uh -huh. um, but one of my other very favorite frameworks um, not necessarily to replace steep, but maybe in addition to steep, um, is something called Verge. And I'm going to post a link about that awesome. Good. in the chat. Uh, Verge uses different categories that it has a bit more focus on the impact of, of changing ah, forces. Interesting. So in Verge, the uh, categories are define, for example, how do definitions change? Do you get a signal for that? Mm -hmm. uh, relate, connect. I mean, what I posted in a chat, you can read what the definitions are. Uh, create, consume, destroy. Those are totally different categories. Yes, exactly. Uh, but th that's another way to maybe keep an, keep an eye on, okay, not only what signals are there out there that you find interesting, but uh, what what is it, what is the diversity of signals? Yes, you, yes, you have? exactly, exactly. Um, and do they meet one of these buckets? And yep. that helps you also be more mindful. I love it. And um, I uh, we not. I'm sorry. I keep picking on Steve here, but um, he sometimes <laughs> refers to himself on our signals calls as silver lining Steve, because I think left <laughs> to our own devices, we can all kind of pick. You know, humans look for danger. I mean, it's how we're wired. It's how we stay safe. So I think yeah. other people in our signals panel um, can, can devolve into end of worldism, which is its own heuristic. It's a cognitive bias. And so Steve always brings some silver lining or tries to. Um, and that's very refreshing. And it has helped me kind of thinking mm -hmm. back to your, your buckets. Yes. It helps me not always look for what's declining or what's collapsing, but to say what's mm -hmm. being born and what's, what's coming up here. All right. It's my turn to ask you a question. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm going to put two together here. Um, Joan G asks, so much is changing continually. Where do you start? So our country seems to be playing catch up rather than planning. But then mm -hmm. one of our 2020 camp alum, Bob Horton says, how do you get an executive from having the foresight to implementing something? So it's kind of a two part question. How do you start? And then once you have it, how do you move to implementation? Mm -hmm. How do I start what? A project? Planning. How do you start planning. planning for the future? 
Oh, okay. Well, that one, how do I start planning? One is um, step number one, define your domain. The future of what? What are you, the planet? Ooh, that's too big. <laughs> the future of your household depends on what you're, what you're trying to achieve. So step number one is just define your topic. Uh, one of my side projects is uh, <laughs> I'm trying to play with this idea of the future of um, psychological well-being in the United States, for example. That's, that's a giant topic. Yeah. Uh, what do I mean by that psychology? Is that only mental, only behavioral, um, other things? So you can, you can sort of flesh out what is your topic area? That's step number one. Um, then the next step is I would use a framework like steep or verge um, to start thinking about all right what are some potential trends to research that shape the future of this domain um, and <laughs> as i've started doing that that can get out of hand very easy it's it's huge <laughs> so you you might need to go back redefine your domain uh, make it more manageable or not it depends on what your objectives are but this is the, those are the two starting steps i would start with what are you exploring the future of and then figure out uh, research, which means a lot of Googling, a lot of reading, a lot of interviewing um, of what are the, what is changing that is shaping the future of this topic. That's, that's the way to get started. Okay. Um, part B of the question. Part B You've was the implementation. Foresight. Yes. Huh. <laughs> How do you get going? Yeah. So that's when I love using strategic doing, which is not strategic foresight. Um, this is a methodology out of Purdue University and with strategic doing what you're doing is you're taking these high level strategic foresight um, conclusions and you're translating them down into concrete collaborative actions, uh, sorry, projects uh, that you can start today um, and that are in alignment with this big picture conclusion. And you can use this methodology to start with one initial project. Um, and then come after you complete that one, you come, you say, you use the same methods to then implement the next project and you keep building up and up towards that bigger picture goal. Um, so the implementation process is that's, that's how I would go about it. And, and basically what strategic doing is, is it makes you build a series of dominoes that get progressively bigger and bigger because of get people getting involved, supporting it. Uh, you're having achievements to demonstrate. There's momentum, um, but then once you hit the first domino, it helps you tackle the second one and so on and so forth. That's the basic gist of the methodology, but it's, it's cool because you don't have to wait for permission or funding to come up with meaningful, high impact, um, easy to do projects that will get you started in the right direction. Yeah, I, one of the things I love about strategic doing is exactly what you said. No money and no permission is required. If you can think of a little project that can get you going towards the future you want, you are only limited by your, by your creativity and by your network. Um, the four disciplines of execution is another framework for getting going. And this is a little more um, sort of organ at the organizational level. So the argument here is your organization already has a shit ton going on. I just lost our rated G. Um, <laughs> ah, shoot. Um, you're already, your organization already has a lot going on. How do you start grafting on new things, even if they're really important? And I think that is an, a really important come to Jesus question that people have to have, because this is why even great plans get shelved is because it's too hard for even good plans to penetrate sort of the, the gravitational force field that is your habits, um, your standing meetings. Like you, you feel like you have to invent two more hours a day in order to add on to this, you know, this additional thing. And so the 40X process is a really nice way of helping you just re kind of downshift the day-to-day -day stuff to make a little more room for these additional things so that they have a chance to grow. So they have a chance to, you know, to take root. So, um, and it's by the same people, you know, the same folks who put Covey together. So the, you know, the seven, the seven habits of highly effective people. So it's good. It's good stuff. It's really good material. Um, let's do a, let's do a, um, a fast round. Yes. I'm going to go all the way to the top of the questions. Okay. Um, 
So, and let's do a quick firing round. I'll ask the question aloud. You give a quick response. I'll give a quick response. We'll see how many we can get through. Steve Craig, okay. as a futurist, what do you find to be the most challenging aspect of futuring work? Yes? Scenario writing. Okay, <laughs> and for me, it is um, being organized and how I deal with clients. Okay, also from Steve, what's the biggest struggle your clients have with futuring? Yes? Oh, imagining surprisingly successful futures that are plausible. Agree. Clients have a really hard time getting out of their own bubble of thought, their bubble of reality. Bob Horton, in your experience, oh, we already talked about this. Katie Simon, we already talked about this. B. Greenberg, DNA, got that. Uh, Joan G., we got her question. I'm going down Aaron Hudson. I feel like everyone is excited to get started with a new process project, but maintaining that momentum, whole different ballgame. Yes? Maintaining momentum. momentum. And then for that project, right? That's, I think, when your organization... Well, okay, two things. One is come up with a, uh, with a rhythm that will keep people involved instead of having huge gaps between activities of the project. But I think momentum is also, and this is it's the same, same logic in strategic doing, um, people love to support successes. I mean, unless you're, you're, you know, you root for the losing sports team, that's, I think that's a different domain. I don't know what's happening there. Right. Um, but typically people love successes or cool things happening and supporting that or being part of it. So to maintain momentum, I think it's critical to demonstrate, to, to make sure everyone understands why the heck you're doing this. What is the bigger purpose here? And to to be to make the process engaging exciting in some way make sure you're doing you're keeping a rhythm that's both doable for the, for the participants but also doesn't help them not to fall out of the the discussion to to stay engaged and maintained in that i think there's a there's there's that and of course demonstrate successes i mean however big or small say so what so what you've done this step what does that mean? Where does it get you? What new opportunities? Yes, this is the brief part. This oh, is the firing sorry. round. The only ah, thing I would shit. add to that is, and Yaz alluded to it, but have fun with this. Have yeah. fun. Um, <laughs> it makes a big difference. Like an easy example is, um, you know, we teach red teaming, how to um, respectfully disagree in a way that doesn't make everybody go, oh, like Rebecca just questioned me. So we send our clients red bandanas, right? Or we ask them to get a red coffee cup or a red clown nose, or God, we had a client whose kid brought in a red devil mask for him to wear during a red teaming portion. Like it's okay to have a good time with this stuff. So give yourself permission to have fun. Steve Craig asks, what about the former model wasn't working that inspired change? Yes, quickly. This is the, why, why did we switch from the seven step process to this four phase yes. one? Um, I think this four phase one is more intuitive or meaningful, easier to understand. Um, and also it, it emphasizes the idea that you could start at any one of these points instead of having to start at step one. You must follow step two. It's not, it doesn't have to be that sequential. Um, and so, so I think that's that, um, those are the two points I would say. That's why we switched. And also Rebecca had this aha moment. So we're, we're just gonna go with it. <laughs> it was a fever dream, Steve. I had a fever dream. But it, it was building for eight months. There were so many things about the process. I'm just, I'm never satisfied. I was raised by German Lutherans and there were just things that were not perfect, that were not repeatable. This, this process should be a process that people can use and be successful with. And there were too many parts of it that felt dependent on us. So it's like, how can we make this more intuitive? How can we make this more trainable? How can we make this more teachable? So it just kind of all poured out of me uh, in the, th this one morning, laying on the black couch right on the other side of this monitor. Okay, next question. Boop, 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 boop. Steve Craig, I don't think you can effectively do sense making by yourself. Okay, that was just an affirmation. Joan G, how do you pick people to put on your SME panel, your subject matter expert panel, your signal panel? How would you do it, yes? How would I do it? First of all, they all have to have relevant, need to be tapped into somehow this domain. And in that subject matter expert example, the domain is public sector, right? So it's people who know something about it or are tapped into it. But then I also, kind of like using the steep framework or verge, 
you want to make sure you have diverse perspectives on it. So you want to be someone who is in literally in government and someone else who's maybe partnering with government and whatnot. So that's, I would look for a diverse set of perspectives, but they're all somehow engaged practically or academically <laughs> with your domain. That's how I would choose. Yeah. I, yeah, our our panel's not perfect. Like we we don't have a person of color on our panel yet, and that's like that's bad on all of us. But we have Republicans and we have Democrats. Um, but we all listen to each other. We're all willing to listen to each other, and um, we're all better for it too. So it started with a core group of like four of us, and then we've added more people over time um, as people drop off or whatnot. But. I think you, like Joan G, in your domains, you know really smart people um, who have different perspectives and who have that important willingness to listen, to not shut people down. Um, I, those feel like the most, the most important. Okay, yeah, Creston, I feel you. I know, you're done. Um, okay, Yes, I have one more question for you, then we're going into the plug zone. We have five minutes left. Mm -hmm. What do you think you're still missing in your mm. repertoire? Mm -hmm. of skills and experience. What are, you, what are you working on developing now? Yeah, what I'm trying to develop is exposing myself to more frameworks and methods in our field. And actually the way I do it is I started listening to a podcast called Future Pod, uh, which is mainly hosted by Peter Hayward. I think he was on this webinar earlier in the year. Um, and it's, he's just going around the planet interviewing different practitioners in our field and asking about them, them, how did they get into it? What is their favorite tool? How do they explain foresight to others? A lot of Australian accents, <laughs> which is fun. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to do that. I, I want to read more about different methods. Um, after grad school, I feel like and I'm still doing my academic uh, papers on the side, I'm really interested in making sure I'm, I'm listening more to the practitioners, at least for this part, um, because I like diversity. Um, so more methods, more, more things that I can play with and merge and, and use and tailor to whatever our clients actually need. That's, that's what I feel like I need more of. Yeah. And for me, I'm doing, I'm, I'm, there's this, there's this saying of like, don't have more than one master, right? And for me, I can get overwhelmed with studying too much. And so I'm focusing on two things. The first thing I'm doing is the Institute for the Future is kind of the 800 pound gorilla in this space. They're, you know, a $9 million annual operating budget. They do a bunch of stuff. It's not inexpensive stuff, but they do cool stuff. And Marina Gorbis, their executive director, I'm a huge fangirl of hers. The Institute has flourished under her. Jay McGonigal works there. I mean, like they just have rock stars who work there. So they have a course on Coursera um, called Ready, Set, Future. And it's terrific. I've learned some stuff. I've recognized where we're ahead of them in thinking through some things. You know, there are things we do that they don't do that I think our way is a little bit better. There are things they've done that I think are very inspiring. And then the other master is, um, there's a futurist named Sohai Inayatula. He is the uh, inventor of causal layered analysis. But he is, the way his mind works, I just find incredibly inspiring. And yeah. um, I am sort of gobbling up everything that he has written, with the exception of a $142 manuscript. If anybody wants to get me an early Christmas present this year. <laughs> His PhD dissertation was basically about his spiritual practice and foresight. And that is very germane for me for many reasons as well, but you can only get it for like $140. So uh, anyway, uh, my address is 809 Spate Street and I'd be happy to have it. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, that's it. Okay, so yes, plug zone. Is there anything that you would like to plug for this group? Yes. I would like to plug our blog. This is very lame. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> if you're not already following us, um, Rebecca and I write interesting stuff or try to be interesting at least on our blog. I pasted the link in the chat. So happy to see you there. Please leave comments so we know what difference it makes. <laughs> I love it. And I'm putting the link to the newsletter sign up. This is my personal newsletter. Um, I mean, it's not personal. It's my professional newsletter, but there, there hasn't been a Yaz writing for us. 
uh, until recently. You know, Yaz is new to our team. Um, so this is still my blog, um, but for sure I link to, um, excuse me, my newsletter, but I link to our blog and so forth. And this is the earliest way that you can find out about these Futures Fridays. So if you're not already on the newsletter list, I really encourage you to sign up. I never waste your time. I love you guys. I don't care if you delete or unsubscribe could care less. Um, but that's the best way to, to get in touch with us. So that's it for this time. Please join me in thanking my special guest, Yasmin Arakan, who is a futurist and one of our, um, one of our MVPs at Next Generation Consulting. I love you guys. You. See you in, we don't have anybody lined up for next Friday. So unless anybody has an awesome idea on somebody we can book on short notice, let me know, but we might be taking next Friday off. All right. See you guys soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.